good to have you and all our international audience as well. Uh, we're three weeks away from the Passover celebration, and today I'm going to be talking about something interesting about the reward that Christ is going to get. But before we get into that, I want to introduce you. Oh, yes, uh, there won't be any uh, church school for the kids today until after Passover because of the type of the messages we're having. So there won't be any, any school for the kids today. But uh, I do want to uh, tell you that uh, we're going to be getting into something interesting, something that many people have never thought about before. Before we do that, though, we've got a, uh, a message from one of our graduates here. Uh, he got his uh, bachelor's, what, two years ago? Yeah, two years ago, he's got his bachelor's from Ambassador Christian College, and he's got a message that will be a continuation from a couple of weeks ago that we saw. Mr. Jimmy Hope. service today. Dear most gracious Heavenly Father, we ask you that uh, you come in here and uh, you open our minds and our hearts to your word. And Lord, uh, let us give your word, not ours. Let it flow through our hearts, mind, body, and soul, and let us uh, to see you in all things. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Um, the, and two weeks ago, I gave um, some of the history of um, the pagan practices of um, Ishtar, um, or Easter as in the um, English translation. I wanted to um, continue with that uh, today with the um, some of the um, practices that um, you'll start to see a um, continuation, you'll start to see a parallel with uh, some of the uh, traditions that uh, the, the Protestant Church has um, pulled in to our um, worship of um, Christ um, during this time. Um, Ishtar, Semiramis, uh, widow of Nimrod, mother of Tammuz, came to be represented as a bare-breasted uh, pagan fertility goddess of the East. Uh, the original pagan festival of Easter was a um, was fornication that celebrated the return of life via the fertility of Ishtar's conception of Tammuz. Worshippers of the Babylonian religion celebrated the conception of Tammuz on the first Sunday after the full moon that followed the spring equinox. They celebrated it by baking cakes to Ishtar, getting drunk, uh, engaging in fornication, and um, lying down in the temple with um, whomever entered. The man was required to leave her money. Babies were sacrificed in honor of these pagan gods, and their blood was consumed by the worshipers. The priest of Ishtar would sacrifice infants and human babies and take the um, eggs of the, um, excuse me, hold on. They would take the they would sacrifice these humans, these little babies, and take the eggs of um, Ishtar as symbols of fertility and dye them in the blood of these sacrificed infants. The Easter eggs would hatch on December 25th, nine months later, the same day her son Tammuz, the reincarnated son, reincarnated sun god, would be born. Are we seeing a thing here? Kind of seeing, and they're kind of trying to parallel it. Trying to, that's why they, they try to incorporate it with our religious beliefs. So we need to worship God in body, mind, and spirit completely. This is where the practice of coloring Easter eggs came from. Many babies born around December 25th from these this fornication that began on the Feast of Ishtar in the spring. And many of these babies would be sacrificed the following Ishtar festival. It was also common for these pagans to bake cakes to offer to the Queen of Heaven on the Friday before the Easter festival. This is where we gained the custom of hot cross buns. As, as kids, we learned the song, hot cross bun. You remember, well, you're singing a song about it. With the cross symbol indicating the female Babylonian symbol for the female was in the circle of the crux and the cross beneath it. Um, If anybody um, out there has ever seen this symbol here, which is a symbol of the female, that is the um, Babylonian um, symbol. I'm going to erase it because I don't want it up here. Because got, uh, the eraser at the top there. Okay. Thank you. Didn't see that? 
that is the symbol of the female, and uh, that is the symbol of um, paganism. Um, Jeremiah spoke against his practices and pronounced God's judgment against them for these practices. If you'll look at Jeremiah 7, 17 through 19, and Jeremiah 44, 19 through 29. Ezekiel also spoke against the celebration of the rites of Ishtar, which were taking place in the temple and the weeping for Tammuz. Ezekiel 8, 14. Refers to the mourning process of the death resurrection symbol of Easter or Ishtar, excuse me, I'm not gonna Ishtar weeping for the death of her son Tammuz, which the women were obliged to emulate. The fertility rites were extended to the agricultural processes and to ensure a prosperous growing season. Pagans rolled eggs decorated with bright colors of spring in their fields, hoping to imbue fertility. These eggs were then hidden, hidden eggs from evil spirits and rabbits' nests, another symbol of fertility. The Ishtar symbolism of the Sunday resurrection of the spring fertility cult, Easter, the Anglo-Saxon form of Ishtar, is a pagan system of worship that first penetrated Christianity in the second century the symbolism stems from the death of Tammuz on Friday and his resurrection on Sunday. This mirrors the grain and new shoot symbolism of the corn harvest which occurred at this time of the year. The 40 days of Lent were picked as one day for each year of his life since he died at age 40. The rest of the traditions of Easter were Christianized into the story of the death and resurrection of Yeshua or Jesus the Messiah. Um, a lot of these things that I talked about the last week, last couple weeks, um, on March 13th of 2017, um, HillaryDaily.com had it um, about um, what the Pope said about um, having a relationship with God. <clears throat> and uh, March 15th, 2007, it was um, AmoryDean.com. You can look these up. Um, I do not, um, I look these up actually. I do not um, just say it off the top of my head. I just wanted to let you know that. I do research this stuff, and it is out there. Um, <clears throat> let's talk about the infiltration into the church. It says Alexander Hislop, the last time that we talked about it, you threw this in. It was an essential principle of the Babylonian system that the sun or the bell was the only God. When therefore Tammuz was worshipped as God incarnate, that implied that he was an incarnation of the sun. Connected with his worship of pagan Lent of 40 days, Hislop adds, among the pagans, his Lent seems, this Lent seems to have been an indispensable preliminary to the great annual festival in commemoration of the death and resurrection of Tammuz, which was celebrated by alternate weeping and rejoicing, being observed in Palestine, Assyria, and June, therefore called the month of Tammuz in Egypt, about the middle of May, and in Britain sometimes in April, to concil con excuse me, conciliate the pagans festivals amalgamated and by a complicated but skillful adjustment of the calendar see they knew that they knew how to trick us into worshiping on the wrong dates by the Gregorian calendar being completed that way we know that we are had I guess you could say by worshiping on the wrong dates that's why they did it like that they knew what they were doing it was found no difficult matter in general to get paganism from Christianity now far sunk in idolatry in this as in so many other things to shake hands. And it's the, um, <clears> that was page 105 of um, Alexander Hislop. And the other one, the part that I talked about earlier about um, that implied that he was incarnation of the sun being Tammuz was on page 96 of that. The New Catholic Encyclopedia comments, since the majority of the early Christians were Jewish converts, it is understandable that from the outset the Christian calendar was governed by the fact of the death and resurrection of Christ had taken place at the time of the chief Jewish feast, the Passover, or Passover, celebrated on the 14th day of the month of Abib, at the full moon following the spring equinox. And this is McGraw Hill, New York, uh, 1967, pages 1062 through 3. They go on to explain why they changed the date for uniformity in celebrating in on the same day each year. 
and later to incorporate the pagan Easter festival. Eusebius of Constantine's era records, when the question relative to the sacred festival of Ishtar arose, it was universally thought that it would be convenient that all should keep the feast on one day. For what could be more beautiful and more desirable than to see this festival through which we receive the hope of immorality, excuse me, immortality celebrated by all with one accord and in the same manner. Um, Vita Constant um, Library, um, the third, 18 through 20. Um, obviously, Eusebius regarded the festival of Ishtar as sacred and rejected the God-ordained festival of Passover, which the true believers had kept along with the Jews up to that time from the apostolic era. Nowhere are the customs associated with Easter sanctioned in the Bible. Nowhere does God command us or encourage us to observe a custom memorializing or commemorating the death of Jesus on the tree. Rather, we are commanded to observe the Passover during Abib, which celebrates our deliverance from sin. Although the emblems of the Passover are to remind us of the suffering and the death of our Savior and the price he paid for us, Passover is a victory celebration of the deliverance and salvation we receive through Jesus, not a celebration of his death itself. There is a distinct and clear difference between the two concepts. God does not want us to commemorate, therefore, the death of his son. The scriptures state, Cursed is everyone that is hung on a tree, Galatians 3.13. When Messiah was hanging on a tree, he became a curse. He became sin for us, our sin offering. Therefore, God the Father turned his back on his own son to allow him to die for our terrible and many sins. Paul wrote, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God in him, 2 Corinthians 5.21. Nevertheless, his death is not the end of the matter. Rather, much more than being justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath from him, through, our, excuse me, through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life, Romans 5, 9-10. Now, I'm going to leave here. Since we're getting into the death and the resurrection, I want to um, hold back a little bit for the next couple weeks in order to tie it in and to tie in the death and the resurrection of Christ. So I'm going to go ahead and um, stop here, and there we can um, finish in the next um, couple weeks. Thank you. Appreciate that very much. Very good research he's done. Good to see all of you here. Good to have you all here. Three weeks from now will be the annual Passover, which is, and most churches are not even aware of it, it's the time when Christ was crucified and he gave us something to do. He said, I want you to do this in remembrance of me. And the whole church world doesn't know that's Passover. They don't get it. They don't understand it. Today, what I want to talk about, if you saw the email that went out, how many, how many of you actually saw the email that was sent out yesterday? Okay. Some of you didn't see the email. Okay. All right. Uh, maybe we need to send it out one, a whole day or two days early to make sure everybody has a chance to see it. Uh, because the title of this message is Jesus' Reward. What is his reward for what he did? He left heaven and he came to this earth. As a man, had to live for over 30 years without electricity. You know, they had to use a fireplace like they used to do in the old days back in the 1700s and 1800s. They didn't have air conditioning. Their air conditioning was to get a you know, fan and fan themselves like we used to have to do when I was a kid because we didn't have air conditioning when I was a kid. So Jesus lived a pretty hard life. He was a carpenter. And he left heaven to come here to do something. And the question is, since the Bible says everything that we do, we're going to be rewarded for it. What is his reward? Now, a lot of people would say, well, his reward will be king over the world. He's going to be the king of kings over the earth. Well, think about that for a moment. He already owned the world, didn't he? He already owned the entire universe under God the Father. He was already the ruler over all that he had created. John chapter 1, verse 3, everything that was made was made by Jesus Christ. Colossians 1.16 says, everything that was made was made by him. 
He didn't need to come here to get the to get the world or to get the universe. Well, why did he come here? Well, so he could walk on the streets of gold, right? Well, he already was doing that. So he could live in heaven? Well, he's living in, he was living in heaven for eternity with God before. What in the world did he get out of it coming here and going to the cross and going through all the horrible suffering that he had to go through? You know, you've heard me tell this. You're probably tired of hearing me say it. So I'll say it just one more time. About three years ago, I had the worst pain I'd ever had in my entire life. I caught pneumonia somehow. And I had never had such pain. And do you know that after going through that, of course, I, I went to the emergency room, if I remember correctly, yes. or the emergency room, and I actually, um, they gave me, I think, morphine or something. But even with that, it was so painful. Several months after that, after I got over that, I, was a, I had a little bit of a problem with God. Not because he let me go through that. But I did. I mean, for several months, I kept thinking, how could a God of love put his son through the kind of pain I went through? And I thought to myself, I had pain in my chest. Every time I would call for something, it was just like somebody taking a knife and stabbing me, whatever that might feel like. But Christ had thorns put in his head. He had nails through, driven through his body, his hands and his feet. He was beaten with a scourge within an inch of his life, and he, was, he would have died from the scourging alone. He went through so much. He went through more suffering than I did, and for several months I thought, how could a, a God of love put his son through that? And it bothered me. Now, I'm a Christian. I believe the Bible. I believe the gospel. But it was just hard. I mean, you fathers who have children, which one of you would put your son through suffering deliberately? like that. You couldn't do it. You wouldn't do it. If I gave you all the money I had, let's say 10 times more than that, and I said, now make your son go out there and suffer and bleed and die. Not one of you. I couldn't pay you enough money to do that. And yet Jesus, the night before he died, asked God the Father, please let this cup pass from me. And in effect, God said, no. Now Jesus could have walked off the job but he loved his father so much that he was willing to die and die the most horrible death that man has ever created. Even Hitler didn't do that. He put him in gas chambers and released the gas, and they died pretty quickly and pretty mercifully. Now, that's still a horrible, monstrous thing. And by the way, this is more of a message today than a Bible study because I've got quite a bit to share with you. So it's going to be more of a, of a sermon than a Bible study. So it won't take a lot of questions. But... But, you know, Hitler was an absolute monster, and even he didn't make people suffer. And yet God the Father asked his son to suffer the most horrible type of death. And our minds don't grasp it. Just what I had, that pneumonia was so bad, it hurt so much, I thought, how could God have had Jesus to suffer more than I did? And obviously he did. But why? What was the point? And what will Jesus get out of it? What will his reward be for what he went through? Now, if you got your Bibles with you today, turn with me to Exodus 12, if you don't mind. We're going to study this, but still it's going to be because of the, the time consideration. There's still going to be somewhat of a, more like a sermon than a Bible study. Chapter 12 of Exodus. In verse 2, God tells Moses and Aaron... This month shall be to you the beginning of months. If you look in the margin, it tells you April, the first full spring month. I know the Jewish New Year starts in September. That's their problem. The biblical New Year is in spring. Speak to the congregation of Israel, saying, verse 3, In the tenth day of this month they are to take a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for every house. Now those who didn't have sheep, God allowed them to have a goat. But they had to have a spotless lamb or goat without blemish. Verse 5 is to be totally without blemish. A male the first year. It was a baby. It wasn't a ram. It was a, a baby within the first year. Young little lamb. Verse 5 is to be without blemish. Verse 6, you're to keep it up until the 14th day of the same month. Well, verse 3 talks about it's according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for a house. So they took they, they chose this perfect lamb on the 10th day. They took it from the flock. They brought it 
to their house. That way they didn't have to go back out and find it again. They brought it to the house. Think about that. And then, of course, they were to kill it on the afternoon of the 14th day. This was a perfect little lamb, perfect. Now, I don't have to tell you, those of you who've been around kids or have owned, uh, who you've, had, you've actually had children, if you've owned a pet and you take that pet into the house, how long does it take for the kids, a little puppy maybe, or even a kitten, how long does it take for them to get attached to it? Yeah. I mean, by one afternoon, they'd, they'd, the kids had fallen in love with that little lamb. You know, any baby birds are cute. They're kind of ugly, but yet they're cute, you know. I've seen these, these little baby monkeys on National Geographic and Discovery Channel. You know, that's a face only a mother could love. But yeah, because their babies are kind of cute. My brother and I had a, had a pet pig when he was just a baby pig. Even baby pigs can be cute. And I can, to this day, like a photograph in my mind, my older brother, I can still see him holding that little pig like he's a baby with a milk bottle and, and you know, giving the milk, feeding that little pig. Uh, we named him Joey, and that was our pet pig. We loved that little pig. Well, as he got a little bit older, he wasn't quite as cute. And my dad made the decision, I think it's time to get rid of Joey. Without my permission, he sold our pet pig to our barber, who renamed him Amos and fattened him up and got him really big. And one day I went to get my hair cut, you know, and he said, boy, that, 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 that pig Amos sure did taste good. He ate my pig. He <laughs> ate my pet. But even a pig, little kids get attached to it. You know, I was, I don't know how old it was, maybe six or seven, but you know, can I hold him? Can I hold him? You know, my brother be feeding him. No, I'm trying to feed the pig and let me hold him. And we pet him, you know, he was just a pig. Can you imagine a, a pretty little lamb, soft, you know? And like, now my dog has long hair and where I love to pet him is right on the top of his head because it's so soft right on the top of his head. God put that fur there so that you'd know where you're supposed to pet the dog because that's where the dog likes to be petted apparently. So can you imagine that little lamb with the fleece and everything and all the little kids, I want to hold him, I want to hold him. Within one afternoon, the children got attached to that lamb. And you know, without me telling you this, that the father would say to the children in love, now, now children don't get too attached. That's our Passover don't get too attached. Yeah, right. And in, and by night, it's too late. You know, they're, they're already, they love that little lamb. And that's on the 10th day. Well, the next day, they get up in the morning. They're going to play with that little lamb. That's their pet. Now, you know, and I know, that that happened every single year. They made a pet out of that little lamb. Every single one of them did. And the father would tell them on the next day, now, don't get attached. I'm telling you, that's our, that's our Passover. And then the 11th day was over. Now the 12th day comes. Well, by now... That little lamb is a member of the family. Pets become a member of the family. And on the 12th day, same thing. I'm telling you, don't get attached. The mother says it's too late. Even the father would get attached too. That's right. That's right. Thirteenth day would come. He'd tell the wife, you've got to do something because tomorrow we've got to kill that lamb. Mm -hmm. And when the 14th day came, every year there were little kids, four, five, and six, who with tears in their eyes pleaded with their daddy, please don't kill our lamb. Happened every year. You say, where's that in the Bible? Listen, you parents know that's what happened. You don't need that in the Bible. You know that's what happened. If you've been around little kids, you already know it. And so the mother, now this happened. I don't have scripture for it, but I'll guarantee you that over the last 14 centuries or 15 centuries from the time of Moses until the temple was destroyed, when well, they haven't done it since, I can guarantee you there were mothers who came up to the husband and said, couldn't we switch the lamb out, let them keep this one, go get one that they're not attached to? No, I can't do that because God said on the 10th day we have to pick the lamb. That's the lamb. Oh, come on. I mean, nobody's going to know the difference. No, I can't do it. Yeah, but the kids are going to cry. It's going to break their heart. And, and yeah, father sometimes shed a tear too because he saw his wife crying. I mean, when my dog died, my, I had my, my beautiful collie when I was three years old, got my collie. He lasted until I was 13, lasted 10 years. But 10 years doesn't seem long to you as an adult. But when you're three years old, 10 years is a long time. It's a lifetime. And when my dog died, I cried. And it was only, it was something like 30 years later that my mother shared with me 
that when she went to work the next day that she had to leave her desk or wherever she was and go into the bathroom and sit down and just cry her heart out because she knew how bad it hurt me. She cried, and I didn't know that, over my dog dying because she knew how it broke my heart. See, that dog was my best friend. Those kids, it didn't take long for a little child to develop a love for a pet. Now, we don't think of the Passover lamb as, as a pet. It was the Passover lamb. We see it from a theological context, but think about the kids. Now, in those days, they didn't have 1.2 children or whatever the national average is today. They had four or five or six kids. They, in fact, the Bible tells us in the book of Exodus they had so many children that the Pharaoh started getting nervous because the Israelites were multiplying so fast. So they may have had average family might have been seven or eight or nine kids in a family. And you know, one of them was only you know two or three years old. There might have been one that was 13. No, it was different ages. But you know how hard it was. In every single family in Israel, there were tears shed over a lamb. Over a lamb. Why did God do that? That seems inhuman. Or it seems uncaring. Or it seems unloving. Why would God do that? Knowing that every single year, little children, their hearts would be breaking. Do you get an idea that that lamb pictured Christ? Do you understand that God wanted them to feel just a very tiny bit of what God himself felt? Because you see, God has emotion. God has emotion. He, how is God going to give you emotion and he doesn't have any? You know, have you ever had anger? Jesus had anger. Where did you get it from? God put it in you. God put those emotions, sadness, happiness, joy. God put that in our psyche. So everything that you have, the way you think, the happiness, the joy, the laughter, the Bible says God laughs. That's in the Old Testament. So God has emotion. Well, when Jesus Christ went to God the Father in the Garden of Gethsemane and said, please let this cup, this cup of suffering, pass away, and God basically said no. And he could have. Jesus said, I know even now we can work this out some other way. And God said no. And made him go to the cross. I need to share some scriptures with you. To help us to understand this a little bit better. <clears throat> you don't need to turn there, but in John 1, 29, the forerunner of, of Jesus Christ, John the Baptist, when he saw Jesus come to his baptism, he said, behold, pointing probably at Christ, the Lamb of God. He probably pointed right at him. The Lamb of God. Jesus was God's Lamb who takes away the sin of the world. Let's go to the book of Acts chapter 8. I want to show you something. <coughs> chapter 8. The story is told about a man named Philip. A man of God who was that God was using in a mighty way, God told him, Arise, verse 26, and go down toward the south, toward the way that goes from Jerusalem to Gaza. You've heard of the Gaza Strip. It's still called that today. And he arose and went, and behold, he saw a man of Ethiopia who was a eunuch of great authority under the queen of the Ethiopians. And he had come to Jerusalem to worship. He was returning. He was sitting in the chariot, and he was reading Isaiah the prophet. Verse 29, The Spirit, see the capital S, the Holy Spirit, said to Philip, Go near and join yourself to this chariot. And Philip ran there to him and heard him read the prophet Isaiah. He's sitting there reading out loud. And Philip's down there listening. And Philip said, Do you understand what you're reading? And the Ethiopian eunuch said, Well, how can I except some man should guide me? He desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. The place of the scripture which he read was this. And if you look in the margin, I'll tell you this comes from Isaiah, the 53rd chapter. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter. Now, Jesus is not a real sheep, but as a sheep would be led to the slaughter. That's how they led Jesus to the cross. And like a lamb, dumb, meaning not speaking before he's sure, so he opened not his mouth. He didn't protest. He didn't scream, holler, and yell. He just very quietly walked with them as they arrested him on the eve of the 14th. That night, when they arrested him, he, he just very quietly went. In his humiliation, this is still from Isaiah 53, verse 33 here, his judgment was taken away, and who shall declare his generation? 
for his life is taken from the earth. Now, Isaiah 53 says he was cut off from the land of the living. But the New Testament here gives us the proper understanding of what it means to be cut off. His life was taken away. To be cut off means he was killed. The eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray you, of whom speaks the prophet? Of himself or of some other man? And then verse 35, Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached to him Jesus. So Isaiah 53, not my interpretation, not my opinion, but according to the New Testament, Isaiah 53 talks about the Messiah who was to come. Now, maybe you didn't know this, but according to the Jewish history, until the first century, the Jews, the rabbis, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the priests of the temple taught that Isaiah 53 referred to the Messiah. They did. They taught that that was the Messiah. But when Jesus came and the apostles began to apply that to this man, Jesus of Nazareth, they changed their interpretation and said, uh, uh, no, 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 Isaiah 53 refers to Israel. Well, when did Israel ever die for the sins of mankind? But up till then, they said, that's the Messiah. And the apostles took that same long-standing understanding, <laughs> long-standing interpretation, and applied it to Jesus of Nazareth. Let's go to Isaiah 53. Let's take a look at it. Because the Jews understood this to refer to the Messiah until they changed its meaning after the time of Jesus. When you go to Isaiah 53, now you know the, 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 uh, the chapters and verses were divided up much later, centuries and centuries later. Look at the last three verses of chapter 52, which ought to be the first three verses of chapter 53. So let's start there. <clears throat> Verse 13 of chapter 52, Behold, my servant shall deal prudently. He'll be exalted and extolled and be very high. As many were astonished, the King James says astony, that's the old English word for astonished, at thee. The T-H-E-E -E is a singular for you. So it's talking not about Israel, but about one man. His visage was so marred more than any man, <clears throat> and his form, his form, his shape, more than the sons of men. So shall he sprinkle many nations. The kings shall shut their mouths at him. For that which had not been told them shall they see, and that which they had not heard shall they consider. They didn't understand this. Even the, even the apostles did not understand that the Messiah had to die the way he did. They didn't understand that. Now, I have a reference Bible, and at the bottom of the page, let me read to you the very short reference. The literal rendering in verse 14 is terrible. Let me read it to you. Quote, so marred from the form of man was his aspect, was his appearance, that his appearance was not that of a son of man. That's how it reads in Hebrew. The reference says that is not human. The effect of the brutality is described in Matthew 26. Because when they would scourge somebody, many men died from the scourging alone. They, they, the scourge was not just a whip. It was a whip with pieces of metal and bone on the end of it. And every time they would hit somebody with that whip it, and then rip it away, it would rip the skin off the person. So his entire body was bathed in, in blood, totally. So the pictures that you've seen, the crucifixes and this type of thing, pictures, portraits, the paintings, they don't portray it at all. They show one little unsightly drop of blood coming from usually the palm, although now they say it was actually the wrist. And that's all they show. They, and they maybe show a little stripe here or there. But no, his body was beaten so bad, so marred from the form of man was his aspect that his appearance was not that of the Son of Man. He didn't look human. He was just a mess. And God the Father asked him to do that. But Jesus could have said, no, I'm not going to do it. And in the Garden of Gethsemane, he would have said, come on, guys, let's get out of here quick. But he didn't. He stood there and allowed them to arrest him so that he could go and be a sacrifice for you. But what reward will Jesus get? Because you, you can't say heaven. He had that before he came. Before he came to the earth, he was already in heaven. Well, to set the right hand of God, well, who, where do you think he was before he came here? Well, so he could rule the universe. Well, he made the universe. So what kind of, kind of reward will Jesus get? 
Let's read Isaiah 53. Who has believed our report and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he, talking about the Messiah, shall grow up before him, before God, as a tender plant and as a root out of a dry ground. He has no form nor comeliness that when we see him, there's no beauty that we should desire him. Now, Jesus apparently was not necessarily a really, really handsome man. He was just an average looking guy. You know, Elvis Presley was not an average guy, but the women went crazy over Elvis Presley when he was young. I guess all the way up until the time he died, they thought, oh, what a handsome man Elvis Presley is. But Jesus just looked, looked like an ordinary guy. Of course, there was no comeliness either on the cross. It was horrible. He is despised and rejected of men, his own people. John chapter 1 says he came to his own, and they rejected him. <clears throat> A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Have you ever gone through that? Don't answer out loud, but it's, have people ever despised you, and you've gone through persecution, people have talked ugly about you, and you find out about it later? Almost everybody has gone through that. Jesus was despised. He was rejected. Surely, verse 4, he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Now, the Hebrew literally says he has borne our diseases. And this is, this is quoted in Matthew 8, verses 16 and 17. And it's quoted correctly from the way it was actually written. For some reason, the King James put griefs and sorrows. Actually, it means diseases and carried our sicknesses. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. Smitten of God. Jesus didn't have to die. God sacrificed him. You remember the story in chapter 22 of Genesis where Abraham went to, we think it was Mount Moriah, to sacrifice his, as Paul calls him, his only begotten son. He went there to sacrifice his son. God sacrificed his son, except this time there was no ram in the thicket. Verse 5, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was wounded through the scourging. He was bruised in that scourging for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. In other words, for, our, for us to have peace with God, he had to be chastised. And with his stripes were healed. Stripes refers to the wounds and bruises he took. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. That sounds like us, doesn't it? Maybe not now, but in the past. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. You can't say that's referring to Israel. That was referring to the Son of God. God the Father laid, not only did God make him go to the cross, then to add insult to injury. He then laid all of our sins on his own son. It was without blemish. It was without sin. And Jesus had... Now, that was the main thing. Some theologians teach this, and they're probably correct, that the main problem that Jesus had in the Garden of Gethsemane was not just the physical pain, but to take all of our sin, which was he despised. Think of all the sins of the homosexuals, the rapists, the serial killers, the murderers. And he took all of that sin on himself. Think of some of the most, for only a moment, because it'll ruin your day if you think about it too much, but think about all the despicable crimes that people have committed. You know, what, the, what people do to children. Even murdering children. I mean, how, how despicable are such crimes? And Jesus took all of that sin, and he bore the punishment for it. That's why he had to be beaten. Have you ever, <laughs> I thought about this only this morning, I breakfast down here at Townhouse, here's this cute little girl about three or four. No, she's five years old, but she looked like she was about three to me. And I said, and I thought as I looked at her, you know, if that was my daughter and some man assaulted her, Christian or not, I'd be after him so hard he wouldn't know what hit him. If I had a daughter like that and somebody walked up and slapped my daughter, I'd be on that guy. I mean, that's how I feel. I don't even have a daughter. Some of you feel the same way. You've got kids that way. Or somebody woke up and slapped your wife, you feel the same way. I mean, you're a Christian or not, you're going to be after them. Think about all the horrible, terrible things that people have done. If somebody did that, wouldn't you want to just beat them within an inch of their life? Now, I know all you Christian men have never even thought about such a thing. 
But let some guy walk up and slap your wife or your, or your daughter. And I mean, brother, Christian or not, you're going to be after them. The way you feel toward that person. Imagine that beautiful little girl that I saw this morning. Some thug assaulting that little girl. I'm not even the father and I feel like killing him. <laughs> Here's my point. Why did Jesus have to suffer? Because he was getting the beating that that man deserves. He was getting the horrible beating and scourging that that rapist deserves. Like we heard on the news, I hope, if you've been watching Fox News, some of the major networks haven't even covered it. This illegal alien, I forget, from Central America somewhere, raped a four, he was 18, he raped a 14-year-old girl in high school. They've, they've talked about it over and over, yet the major networks won't talk about it because it, it shows that Trump is correct. President Trump is saying, let's get rid of these illegal, illegal aliens. And this would simply add fuel to the fire. So CBS, NBC, and ABC will even cover it. Fox News has covered it for several days. How many of you have, have heard that story? Okay. The rest of you haven't been watching Fox News because they'll tell you stuff the other networks won't tell you. I forget what state it was. Maryland. Was it Maryland? I knew it was somewhere up in that area. In Maryland. An 18-year-old boy who was in the first year class because he learned to speak English. He was from some other country. And he was illegal. And a 17-year-old boy took this girl in the, uh, in, the girl in the boy's bathroom and raped her. Now, if that was my daughter, <laughs> you see what I'm saying? Oh, well, Keith, you're not very Christian. Okay, I'm not very Christian, but don't touch my daughter. You understand? You understand? Your sons too, yeah. I mean, yeah, if some man assaulted your boy. I mean, you'd be after him like, uh, he may be twice your size. It doesn't matter. He could be three times your size. He better get out of the way because you're coming after him. That's how you feel. Well, that's what God did to Jesus. He took all that punishment that you want to give to that thug and he punished his own son. He was the whipping boy. Now, you still don't like the guy that assaulted your child. But you have to understand, if that man repents, do you know God will forgive him? Because somebody else already took the beating that he deserves. The beating that you want to give that guy, Jesus already took it. And if he repents, then the beating that Christ took applies to him, and he doesn't have to take it. Boy, is God merciful. He's a lot more merciful than you fathers are. <laughs> He's a lot more merciful than you husbands are. He's a lot more merciful than I would be. And that's why he's God and I'm not. Amen. But Ephesians 5, 1 says, imitate God. So I'm trying to have that kind of love. But if I had a daughter, I'd still say, but don't you touch her. <laughs> I mean, the, the, the anger that you have for that person, all that anger was poured out on Jesus Christ, and he took the beating, and that's why he had to suffer. Well, what kind of reward is he going to get for that? Let's read on. Verse 7, he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shears is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. Dumb means can't talk. The sheep can't talk, but Jesus didn't talk. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who shall declare his generation, in which we just read this verse, in chapter 8 of Acts, for he was cut off out of the land of the living. Why? For the transgression of my people was he stricken. This can only be Jesus. And he made his grave with the wicked and the rich in his death. He died with the wicked, two wicked men on either side of him. He was buried in a rich man's tomb. Because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. That's got to be Jesus because you couldn't say that about any other human being. The Apostle Paul says in Romans 3, everybody has sinned. But this man, whoever we're talking about here, never sinned. And this has to be the Son of God. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. It pleased God. That doesn't mean that God was happy about afflicting punishment on, on his own son. But in order to get you off, in order to, 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 to save you, it pleased God the Father to put all of your punishment on him so you don't have to suffer. Amen. And you don't need to turn there, but in John chapter 17, Jesus said, let them know that you love them as you've loved me. Well, we know that God loves Jesus, but if, if he does love one more than the other, 
Looks to me like he loves you more than he loves Jesus because he made him suffer and you get off scot free. That's not fair. There is nothing fair about it. And yet that was his plan to show you how much he loves you. He wanted to demonstrate that. And I just, you know, they say words are cheap. And yet God wanted to show you his love. It pleased the Lord to bruise him, verse 10. He has put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. When God makes his soul, Jesus, an offering for sin, then God will see his seed. Now, seed means children. He shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand, and he shall see of the travail of his soul, and shall be satisfied. God saw the travail that Jesus went through, and now he's satisfied. The punishment has been satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. My righteous servant, God the Father says, will justify or make righteous many, for he, my servant, shall bear their iniquities. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he, Jesus, has poured out his soul unto death. And he was numbered with the transgressors. Actually, somebody said, well, how many people died today uh, over there, you know, when the day was over? And all oh, there were three thieves, three criminals that were killed today. No, there were two criminals. The one in the middle was innocent. But he died as a transgressor. He was numbered with the transgressors, and he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Hebrews 5 says he's our high priest. Jesus compared himself to a seed. He compared himself to a seed. Let's go to the New Testament in John chapter 12. John chapter 12, verse 1, Then Jesus, six days before the Passover, the Passover feast, which that year started Wednesday evening at sundown, came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, who had been dead, whom he raised from the dead. This was six days before the Passover. Now, if you do a study on this, the Passover feast started Wednesday night, or Thursday being the first day. You go back six days, that brings you to the ninth day of Abib. So it was a Friday night, Sabbath evening meal, where he was eating with Lazarus and his two sisters, Mary and Martha, and uh, he was, that was a Friday night. Well, right now we're told, verse 12, and on the next day, which would have been Saturday morning, much people were come to the feast. Why? Because the next day was the 10th day of the month of Abib when they took the lamb from the fold. And Jesus rode into Jerusalem, and that was the day they laid the palm branches before him. That was the day they said, Hosanna, blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. Verse 14, Jesus, when he had found a young ass, sat there on it, is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, the king comes, sitting on ass's colt. They didn't understand this at the time. But verse 13, they took branches of palm trees and went forth to meet him and cried, Hosanna, blessed is the king of Israel that comes in the name of the Lord. So on that day, they accepted Jesus as the Messiah on the 10th day. The Jews, finally, the whole population, I mean thousands of people who were there at the feast, was out there celebrating and hollering and shouting, and they accepted Jesus as their Messiah. And in so doing, unwittingly, they accepted him as the Lamb of God also. Verse 23. And Jesus answered them, saying, The hour is come that the Son of Man should be glorified. All through the four Gospels, he, when they tried to kill him, they tried to throw him off of a cliff one time. They tried to stone him. Chapter 10 of John, they picked up stones to kill him. And, and what did Jesus say over and over and over? My hour is not yet come. He said that again and again. My hour is not come. Well, just before he was to die on the cross, he said, okay, now my hour is here. In fact, in John 17, the night before the crucifixion, he said, Father, now, now my hour is come. So he's talking about the hour of his death. Verse 23, the hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Verily, verily, in, old, in modern English, that means truly, truly, I say to you, Except a corn of wheat. Now, corn is Old English for grain. Except a grain of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abides alone. But if it die, it brings forth much fruit. Do you understand, as your commentaries will explain, that this grain of wheat refers to Jesus himself? He was that seed 
that if he were to die, he would bring forth much fruit. Now, you can take an actual corn seed, which we're very familiar with. My parents had a garden. You take one little yellow corn seed and plant it, and a stalk would come up with two to three, sometimes four ears of corn. One time I sat down and uh, I'm going to eat corn on the cob, you know, and I just told you to see how many grains individual seeds are on this corn on the cob. I counted 250. You know, average size uh, ear of corn, I counted 250 seeds. And that all came from one seed. And you have three ears of corn that come from one seed. So that's your fruit that you get out of seed. So Jesus was the seed that God s s sowed into the earth to get back much fruit. He that loves his life shall lose it, and he that hates his life in this world or loves his life less by comparison to his love for God shall keep it to life eternal. If any man serve me, let him follow me, and where I am there, my servant will be. So wherever Christ is, that's where we're going to be also if we will serve him because we're the fruit that Jesus produced as a result of his death. Verse 27, Now is my soul troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. Notice the word hour. But for this cause, I came unto this hour. He came here to die. Verse 32. And if I be lifted up, any commentary will tell you, that's talking about being lifted up between heaven and earth on the cross. If I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men to me. 33. What was he talking about? This he said, signifying what death he should die. We well, don't need to turn to Romans 6, but all of us are familiar with Romans 6, 23. It says that the wages of sin is death. Wages are what we earn. Jesus got our wages. Amen. Think about that. We earned it, and he got paid. Normally, normally, if we earn something good, we want to get paid for what we earned. But we, we earned the wages of sin, which is death. So he took our wages so that we don't have to take those wages. In Hebrews chapter 5, you may want to turn with me to Hebrews chapter 5. Did Jesus have emotions? He's called in verse 1 our high priest. Well, there it's talking about high priest uh, of the Levites, but it likens Jesus to a priest also. But he's the priest of a different order, the Melchizedek order. Verse 6, he says in another place, according to the Old Testament, Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek, talking about Christ, who in the days of his flesh, now when Paul wrote this, if the date at the top of my page here says A.D. 64. So over 30 years later, when he wrote this, Jesus was now in his glorified spirit body in heaven with God. But when he was here in the flesh, who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications, listen to this, with strong crying and tears unto him who is able. He was praying to him, meaning God, who was able to save him from death. He was heard and that he feared. And though he were a son, the son of God, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. How about that? Jesus, with strong crying and tears, prayed to God who was able to save him from death, and yet God said no. Think about that. Did Jesus have emotions? Yes. He didn't just say, oh, well, it's time to go to the cross. I mean, there was strong crying and tears for what he had to go through. Let's go to Luke 22. I want to share something with you here. You've heard it said that Jesus sweated blood. There's no scripture that says that. It's not the Bible. That's a careless, very, very careless reading of scripture. But he did sweat profusely. His perspiration was literally dripping like an open vein, but just drip, blood, drip, drip, drip. That's how he was sweating, because there were tears and strong crying this night. Luke 22 and verse, 
let's start in uh, let's start in verse 39 he came out and went as he was wont as he was accustomed to the Mount of Olives and his disciples followed him and that's where that garden of Gethsemane is and when he was at the place he said to them pray you that you enter not into temptation and he was withdrawn from them went over there in a private place about a stone's cast and kneeled down and prayed saying father if you be willing remove this cup from me nevertheless not my will but thine be done he was asking God to remove the cross. He tried to get out of the crucifixion. You know why? Because he was human, 100% human. There appeared an angel from heaven strengthening him, but that still didn't help much. And being in an agony, verse 44, he prayed more earnestly. You ever prayed very, very, very earnestly? Not just... You know, bless this food, but I mean, you're really in earnest with God because there's something you really need. Jesus prayed in agony. That, that's why there was strong crying and tears. He prayed more earnestly. His sweat was, as it were, great drops of blood falling down the ground. Nowhere does the Bible say he was actually bleeding. That's not what the scripture says. It plainly tells us it was perspiration. But his sweat was, as it were, like you had an open vein, drip, drip, drip. We might say like a leaky faucet. You ever seen somebody so full of sweat has <laughs> fallen off of them? Well, that's how Jesus was. You ever been to a steam room maybe and people sitting in there sweating in the steam room or whatever? Jesus was sweating so profusely he was just dripping off of his face. Why? Because he was going to have to suffer the most horrible death that man had ever come up with. He was going to have to be beaten. And this went on for hours. It didn't go on for a few minutes like I had it when I was at the hospital. And that was horrible. So I can only begin to imagine what he went through. And Jesus prayed, don't make me have to go through this. And yet, if God the Father wanted him to do it because of his love for you, he was willing to do it. That's what this Passover is all about. How many churches are getting ready to celebrate the very day and the week, the holy week, that pictures his crucifixion? No, they're planning to do what... Jim told us about earlier. They're getting ready with their chocolate-covered Easter bunnies and their dyed Easter eggs. And I recommend you do get Dr. Alexander Hislop's book written in the 1800s about the origin of Easter. But churches ought to be celebrating the very day that pictures the death of the Messiah. And they're not doing that because they say, oh, it's Jewish. Well, maybe it's Jewish, but our Jewish Messiah died on that day. And we ought to respect that. So Jesus prayed in great crying and tears because he was very emotional. Why did the Father sow this one seed into the earth? Well, we just read. We just read in the book of John where if a grain of wheat fall into the ground and die, that little seed doesn't come back. It's gone. But it produces a, a fruit or it produces a harvest. It, it, that's why we call it at the grocery store. We call it produce. It produces something. And so Jesus likened himself to one grain. God sowed the one son he had into the earth, this earth, to produce a harvest of souls to obtain other sons and daughters. 2 Corinthians 6.18 you are my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. I've heard people say that in the kingdom there won't be men and women. We're all going to be unisex. Don't believe stuff like that. I just heard a preacher yesterday saying there won't be male or female. That is totally wrong. There is no scripture that says there won't be male or female. So ladies, don't worry about it. You're not going to become a man. You know, you've heard me mention this before, how when George Washington comes up in the resurrection, he looks over there and he sees Martha, and he says, Martha, is it really you? She says, hi, George, you know, now she's a man. How ridiculous. Did you have a question? No, where they get that from is uh, when the woman's husband had passed, and the question was, who... It says they won't be getting married, yeah. yeah. It doesn't say there won't be male and female, it just says you won't be getting married. I mean, after all, if I'm not a man, then what am I going to be? And you ladies, if you're not who you are, then who are you going to be? You're going to be something else, something else. No, we're still going to be men and women, but we just won't be getting married. That's what the Bible is showing us. He says there's no get getting married. So we'll be like 
brothers and sisters. Now, my mother had two husbands. Her first husband was killed. She never got over him entirely. Never did. She loved my dad. They had the happiest marriage of any married couple you could find just about, but she still loved her first husband. So in the resurrection, they're going to be like brothers and sister. There won't be any jealousy. There's not going to be marriage, so you know they're going to get along with like one big happy family. But we're still going to be men and women. We're still going to be male and female. We're going to be children of God, fully, fully uh, developed children of God with our glorified, God-like bodies. First John uh, three two says that we're going to have a body like Jesus. We're going to have a glorified body, but we just won't be getting married. But we can still be male and female. So God took the one son He had, His only begotten Son, John three sixteen and sowed him into the earth like a seed to get a family. Let's go to just a couple of more scriptures and we'll be concluded today. Hebrews chapter 2. God wanted to add to his family. You know, Jesus said a corn of wheat, King James, or a grain of wheat, uh, in Matthew 13, wheat is likened to Christians and the tares are likened to the wicked. The wheat, the wheat and the tares, Christians and, and those who are not Christians. The, the, the wheat, he said, would be gathered into the garner, or the modern word, the granary, and the tares will be taken out and burned. So the non-Christians are going to get burned and, and destroyed in the lake of fire, whereas the wheat, God's going to take them and keep them. In chapter 2 of Hebrews, beginning in verse 9, we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for a time. Why? For the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor today, that by the grace of God he should taste death for every man. For it became him for whom are all things, and by whom are all things. He made everything. It became him in bringing many sons unto glory. Now, it uses it in the masculine gender here, but obviously we're still going to be male and female, so we're all going to be, as it were, sons of, of God. That's why some people think there won't be females. Oh, yeah. And we're not all going to be sons in the male gender because he said sons and daughters in 2 Corinthians. But he's just speaking here in the, in the, in the masculine gender here. He wanted to bring many sons into glory, to make the captain of their salvation, that's Jesus, perfect through sufferings. For both he that sanctifies, God sanctifies, and they who are sanctified, that's us, are all of one. One family. For which calls he, Jesus, is not ashamed to call them brethren, brothers and sisters. Jesus is not ashamed to call you his brothers and sisters because he gave his life for you saying, I will declare your name to my brethren in the midst of the church while I sing praise to you. And again, he's quoting scripture, I will put my trust in him, and again, behold, I am the children which God has given me. He's, when he says again and again and again, he's talking about, here's a scripture, here's a scripture, here's another scripture. So Jesus said that there, there's I and there's also the children which God has given me. The children of God which came into the family of God through Jesus Christ. Think about that. Let me ask you this question. What is Jesus' reward for all the suffering, the beating, the persecution? People spat on him. They slapped him. It says they buffeted him. And they finally killed him. What kind of reward is he going to get? Don't say, well, he's in heaven. He was there before. Well, he'll be king of the world. Well, he already owned the entire earth. He made it. Well, he'll rule the whole universe. Well, he already made the whole universe, too. So what, what kind of reward is he going to get? Let me tell you what his reward is. I'm going to tell you right now. Here's the answer to that question. The only reward he's going to get for all he went through is you. Glory. That's it. You're it. You're the reward. I could ask you, are you worth all he went through to get you into God's kingdom? Well, all, the, all of us would say, well, no, I don't think so. You know, it's been said, and I agree with it 100%, that Jesus did not die for you because you are worthy. You are now worthy because he died for you. 
He died for you, and that's what makes you worthy. You know, one of my heroes from the colonial period is Benjamin Franklin. He said one of the best ways to get somebody like you is ask them to do something for you. And I heard a sermon years ago who said that even though God is the same yesterday, today, and forever, he doesn't change. If he has changed in his love toward us, he probably loves us more now than before Jesus died. Because look at the tremendous sacrifice God had to make, and look at the tremendous sacrifice Jesus had to make to get you into his family. If anything, he loves you more. Why is it that God makes mothers go through the pain of childbirth, the, the labor pains? I mean, sometimes it's a real pill, so they tell me. They say it's horrible. And sometimes the, the wives will even cuss the husbands <laughs> for getting, making them go through this pain and suffering. Yeah, it happens. You know, my mother explained it to me one time because she told me I was I was a very uh, hard child to have. And uh, she said, but I think it causes the mother to love her child more. If you go through suffering and you go through pain and you go through travail and hardship to bring that child into the world, you're going to bond with that child because you went through so much to get that child here. Did you know that Jesus Christ loves you with every ounce of his being because he gave every ounce for you? He loves you with all of his heart. And don't say, well, yeah, but you know, I haven't been perfect, and I've done this, and I've done that. I think God's mad at me. Maybe he doesn't love me anymore. You get mad at your kids, but you still love them. Sometimes you get mad at them for their benefit. Sometimes you get mad at them just because they're going to hurt themselves. You know, sometimes fathers will yell at their son, don't do that, and they're mad not because of any personal offense to the father, but because if you do that, you're going to get hurt. And you yell at the kid because you don't want him to get hurt. God does get angry with us, but it's for our benefit because he loves us. God the Father went through a horrible sacrifice. Do you realize he risked losing his very best friend for all eternity? The Bible says that the goings forth of Jesus, this is in Mal uh, Micah chapter 5 and verse 2, his goings forth are not from Bethlehem, but they're from everlasting. And so God the Father had spent an eternity with the one we know as God the Son, Jesus. And he risked losing him to get you. I heard a father say one time, he said his, his son had leukemia. No, I think this was the minister quoting the father the way it was. And uh, this father said, I wish I could take his place because it's harder for me to watch him suffer knowing I'm, I'm helpless. I would, if I could, I'd take his pain. I would take that leukemia from him so that my son wouldn't have to suffer. But of course he couldn't. And God the Father suffered when he watched his son down there in the Garden of Gethsemane, begging the Father not to make him go through this. And God had to say no. And on the cross, there was a point in time, you know, Jesus said, God is, I'm never alone for, God is always with me. Remember, he said that in the book of John, I'm never alone for the Father is always with me. And on the cross, what did he cry out? Probably in shock, terror, for the first time in eternity, he said, why have you forsaken me? For the first time in eternity, he did not feel the presence of God. It's been explained, and I agree with it, by quite a number of clergy that it's like God turned his back on his son. And Jesus died without God. The same way the most wicked man has ever died, he dies without God. That's how Jesus died. He died like a lost man. He died like a sinner. Yes, sir. So then he experienced the separation from God that the evil will, that will experience at the end after the um, whenever God comes back and sets forth, whenever Jesus comes back, that separation from God is what he experienced there on the cross mm -hmm. because he was completely without God because God mm -hmm. completely couldn't look upon sin, so right. he had to turn his back, so he exactly. was completely in that darkness and that, that yeah. away from God. God laid all the sins we read in Isaiah 53 on his own son. And when all the sin was on him, it was as if Jesus was guilty of all the sins we've committed. And so, like a, a lost man who's not 
a Christian, he died without God, and that's a horrible way to die. Imagine that. God turned his back on him, and Jesus died alone. It's a horrible thing to be alone. You know, I'm never a lonely man because I have God in my life. I mean, I, don't, I can't imagine not being a Christian. God is so real to me that I can, I, if, if I ever went to prison, I'd say, put me in solitary confinement. I'd be very happy. Get me away from all these crooks and criminals out here. Just give me a Bible, put me in solitary confinement, and I'll be happy. Just me and God. You know, it'd be a great time. But can you imagine when if God just left you and you feel an emptiness on the inside? Jesus felt that emptiness for the first time. And he screamed out. He wasn't quoting scripture. He screamed out, my God, why have you forsaken me? And he died alone. He did that in order to get a reward. And the reward that he's going to get is us. We are his reward. Jesus said in John 14, 15, if you love me, and everybody in this room would say you love him, but this is what he tells people who say they love him. If you love me, keep my commandments. He told us to take the Passover in remembrance of him. That's the least we can do. So are you going to be with us on this annual event to, to take the Passover celebration? April the 11th this year, Tuesday night at 8 o'clock right here. Will you be with us? If you're a converted, baptized Christian, are you going to be with us to, to memorialize on the very night that Jesus ordained it? Will you be here with us to take that Passover? Now, are there any questions at this point in time or any final comments? Did you get anything out of this? Yeah, if there's any adult here who has not been baptized by immersion and you have repented and you want to keep God's commandments, we are having a baptism. The, the YMCA has still not contacted me, but we're hoping to do it on the 9th of April, Sunday night at 530. So if any of you are interested, be sure to let us know. You're God's reward. You're the reward that Jesus is going to get. So just live for him the best you can because you're all he's going to get. Amen? Amen. All right. We'll see you all next time. Thanks for coming. We're dismissed.